thank you everyone for being with in our webinar today. We're very excited to be back talking about one of the most important topics in transfer pricing, which is intra-group services. So today, uh, Hon Chan and myself will be talking about some key factors, key aspects that need to be uh, taken into consideration with, when setting up intra-group services. <clears throat> so before we enter into the detail, just a couple of housekeeping. Um, there is a Q and A um, box where people can place their questions, and we will do a, a question time at the end of the webinar. And also for those who are new to our uh, monthly webinars, it is good to have a small introduction about who we are. We are a firm that specializes in providing transfer pricing advisory services to multinational companies in uh, Asia. We are three offices, our head office is located in Australia, our regional head office in Singapore and our Malaysian office of three offices. We basically cater to the Asia region, everything to do with transfer pricing. We are basically on it. Um, apart from that, we also regularly contribute to industry um, journals and we have also been qualified as year two transfer pricing firm. With that, maybe I let Hon Chuan to introduce himself for those who don't know him. Hi guys, how's it going? Um, I'm Hong Chuan, Director of Transfer Pricing Solutions Malaysia. Um, basically, I have more than a decade of um, transfer pricing experience, advising multinationals going through their transfer pricing issues and helping them fix their transfer pricing issues, so to speak. And yeah, as you all know, we have been doing webinar for over over two years. I think over the COVID um, year, and yeah, I think we are, we'll be continuing doing this to actually help create um, transfer pricing awareness, um, so that you know people would be able to know what transfer pricing is and all about, and you know maybe take more actions to it. Thanks, Adriana. Thank you, Hong Chuan, and myself. My name is Adriana Calderon. I'm the <clears throat> director and co-founder of Transfer Pricing Solutions Asia and Malaysia. I have about 15 years of experience plus advising multinational companies in the area of transfer pricing, also together with international tax and tax. Nevertheless, I specialize in transfer pricing uh, lately. So as Hon Chantan says, we are very happy to continue with our webinars and share with you our knowledge. And I guess hopefully everyone can get a tip out of our presentation today as well. So we will be talking about first an overview of intergroup services, basically what is the general uh, approach, what are the key consideration. We will then be talking about Malaysia transfer pricing guidance on intra-group services. And last by, but not least, we will be going through some court cases, which uh, is a bit of an unusual topic to put in webinars, but I think it's quite useful because it's a way to understand really how in a dispute would the tax authority and the court will look at intra-group um, services. So we are very excited about sharing that with you all today. So with that in mind, let's start with an overview of intra-group services. And um, Chuan, I pass it on to you maybe to provide us a little bit of an overview. Yeah, thanks, Adriana. I guess the reason why we would like to cover this topic is actually to create awareness on the importance of you know getting your transfer pricing evaluation into intra-group services correct. As we have experienced almost all the audit that I've faced actually touched on services one way or another, right? So it's actually imperative to actually to for you to understand the TP rules behind the intra-group services and how to actually act upon it. Right. So now let's look at 
the you know the various type of uh, services that you may encounter. You know, you have your admin, technical, finance, marketing, sales, R and D, and obviously we have the the famous one, which is the management services, which I actually see a lot um, in Malaysia, unfortunately. And I'm sure Adriana has been hearing a lot of this from me. Every time I talk about services, I'm actually not really a fan of uh, management services where companies actually you know, compile all the services that were performed um, and then put it into one and then call it management services, right? Which may not necessarily be the right way to do it which I guess you you learn more later when I start going through other sections about intra-group services, how, how it works and what's the way to actually set it up. Um, there are also various reasons like why um, intra-group services exist within a group, right? There's reasons to incentivize the group to have intra-group services in place. What well, first thing would be to actually centralize you know, centralizing the services for the group is actually to, it's both cost effective and efficient to the group, right? It makes sense when you pull all the talents in one place and then provide those services um, to the recipient of the group instead of going through the hiring process for each jurisdiction, each um, sub within the group to provide similar services, right? So, even better if you actually centralize it in a country that has lower labor costs, right? That's why when you see, you'll be able to see a lot of BPOs, right? Business process outsourcing uh, businesses in countries like Malaysia, um, Philippines, and Vietnam, more, more or less the developing countries where, you know, they're, they're developing and they, their labor are actually at a, a lower range than developed countries. Now, now that we have looked through services, maybe you can look at how to properly set up a service transaction on the next slide. So um, first, yeah. Hong Chan, can you just uh, pause for one minute? A couple sure. of people have given me the feedback that there oh. is an echo. Oh, they can't hear me. Right, okay. Uh, is there uh, me, anything we can check. do on your uh, side? Yeah, maybe it's mine. Uh, I'll try and change my microphone on. There you go. Right. Okay. I think maybe because of the uh, the air conditioning. Oh, okay. Okay, okay, okay. So yeah, apologies. Okay. But now I think now is better. Okay. So let's yeah. continue. Yeah. So we were going to just uh, following going through the following slide about the key aspects that we have to consider when setting up a service transaction. Feel free to go ahead, Hanchan. All right. Now, first, when you look at service transaction, obviously in TP, first step would, would be the, your TP planning. It would be great for you when you have a service transaction in mind, right? You want to set it up, you want to implement it. The best way is to do it is to ensure that, you know, Okay, so services is actually rendered by the provider, right? Which is where, this is where we assess, assess the substance element, right? You need to have employee stationed and remunerated at the location of the provider, right? That's, that's the first important step where you want to provide a service. And after which, you perform a benefit test where we assess the benefits received by the recipient. And then we go forward down to cost base. So, Point to note that you know an arm's length markup is not an only important element here, right? Actually, the first important element is cost base, right? We need to make sure the cost base attributable to the service performed is actually accurately accounted for, right? Before going to the markup, right? The next stage is then to determine your arm's length markup, right? Generally, by way of you know, your benchmarking studies. Right, to ensure that you have arranged flavors and you want to make sure that your markup uh, is actually within the interpretal range of the benchmark studies. Now, once you have this first three elements in place, it is very crucial. Um, it was recommended last time, but it's actually very crucial now to actually formalize all your related financial transactions arrangements into a contract. 
right? So that you can document down the nature of the service, you can document and address you know, the key elements that we have um, explained earlier of the transaction into the contract itself, right? So then once you have a contract in place, you start implementing it, after which you will then have a TP analysis, um, your, your normal um, TP compliance to perform, to document and then determine the arm's length principle has been adhered to, right? So actually once you've gone through this process, right, the TP compliance is more so just to, as a compliance to actually test back what you have tested, right? With all the benchmarking they've performed, um, the nature and the benefit test they've done previously, the TP analysis is just to combine and then retest it and then put it in a uh, transfer pricing documentation, right? In waiting for the RFP to come in, that's for it. So this is how we set up. So once you have gone through this process, um, you then have a proper service transaction in place that it's arm's length. Thanks, Honchman. I think these are a few very good points that you have raised. Um, <clears throat> this framework is what we call kind of the operational aspect of setting up a service transaction because most of the TP documentations focus in or, well, depending on how you go about it, focus on testing a markup, um, if a markup is required, and on revising some as aspects of this. But I think the operational side on service, on how to set up a service charge is usually underlooked. We found that every time we assist clients with implementing a service transaction for the first time, there is a lot of questions, even though it looks easy, there is a lot of questions around all these aspects that are key to successfully implement the transaction. So I guess then another big question in services is like, can a multinational group charge for any type of services? And with that, maybe you can give us an overview, uh, Hong Chuan, to answer that question. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, that's one of the main things um, you'd be looking at as to, you know, what kind of services are you know, under the purview of TP and what not. Right, so there are various types of activities and it's critical to be able to distinguish, you know, we call it two broad categories, non-chargeable activities and chargeable activities, right? And that can benefit specific individual, the parties or the group as a whole. Right, first up, we'll go through the non-chargeable one first. Now, we have the four types of non-chargeables based on the Malaysian Transfer Pricing Guidelines. Now, the first one is shareholder activity, right? These activities are activities that was, they are actually performed generally by the holding company on behalf of the group, right? So if it's more towards the parent entity's responsibilities to prepare or to perform such activity on behalf of the group, then in that essence, then these services are actually non chargeable right? They're treated as um, shareholder activities, you know, like preparation of your um, consolidated accounts, for example, that's uh, the holding company. The next one is duplicative activities, meaning, you know, as what the name suggests, it's more so that the recipients would have performed the same functions as though as the ones that are received by the provider, right? So if the recipients has an accounting department and the holding company provider is also charging accounting services, similar services that is actually performed by recipient, that would be non-chargeable because they are actually duplicating your activities. Then the third one is you know activities that provides incidental or passive association benefits, which relates to any benefits enjoyed by one company within a group, mainly because you know, the company is part of the group, right? These then are deemed as non-chargeable, right? An example of this is when it's subsidiary borrowed for a, for a bank, for example, and obtain a lower interest merely because it is part of the group and that group has a good credit rating, then by right, without 
doing anything, but right then that's not chargeable. Having said that, if on the other hand, um, parent entity actually provides a guarantee for um for the share um the subsidiary to the bank, then that is considered a chargeable activity because the holding company is actually making an effort at providing a guarantee, right, to obtain that lower interest rate. And lastly, on call services, where you have related party on hand to provide ad hoc on call services. You know, we are talking about services like financial or legal tax, right? These are actually not, you can't really charge these as on call, so to speak, right? The position of the IRB regarding on call services is that the service is not chargeable because these services are easily obtained and promptly available without any standby arrangement, which means that you wouldn't need, you wouldn't require these on-call services if you are able to actually obtain to another party or independent party to get these services easily. And then the potential for this service is actually quite remote. It's not really necessary. And then when there's say no or negligible benefits received, right? We should discuss later. But generally on call services, you have received really no benefits um, from these services, then these are non-chargeable. Obviously, there are some um, exceptions I'll go through in the next slide. So then the next slide, I'm not I'm more talking about the chargeable services, which will have circumstances for the ones that are non-chargeable. But for chargeable services, they are merely services rendered solely for the benefit of um, the specific related party, as well as centralized services such as an outsourced center providing services that benefits the group. Right. So th those are um, still chargeable. And then you have your ancillary or subsidiary services. You know, these are services rendered in connection with other transactions. For example, transfer of property, for example, intangible properties, or the commencement or the effective use of a property, right? So these are in it supplements um, the transfer of property, for example. So the RRB will require that the charges for these services or ancillary services to be shown, hopefully to be shown separately, or it has to be, can be shown separately. Right, so you have both in place, then you have to actually separate it into a service component and then a transfer of property component, right? To clearly distinguish what's a service, what's the um, transfer of property. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are certain exceptions um, to the non-chargeable um, circumstances, right? So in terms of on-call services, for on-call services to be chargeable, it must be proven that an independent party in your similar circumstances would incur such charges to ensure availability of the services when the need for them arises, right? So one of the examples that I can give you is your know, on-call services for IT services, in especially IT hosting services, where you know, normally you have a contract and within the contract, you would have that there will be terms and conditions in respect to the server being provided. And they would have to have like a 99% or 99.5% um, uptime. So which means when there's a, an issue arises, right? The provider will need to ensure that the issue is rectified then then to ensure they have like that to satisfy the 99.5%, 99.9% uptime. That's when it's chargeable, right? And then obviously all this will needs to be documented down um, into the contract to make sure that you, know, you can explain to RRB why this on-call service is actually chargeable. Then lastly, for duplicative services, it's only under circumstances where it's for a temporary measure I think for the basis of it could reduce the risks of your of business impact, right? From wrong decision making, right? In terms of you know, when you provide a service, 
obviously then if a second opinion is required to ensure that you know no wrong decision is actually made then those service can be chargeable right as long as it's properly substantiated why thank you <clears throat> hon chan so i think uh, coming to our framework uh, the first thing that we need to understand is what type of activities are we performing and then are they in the chargeable territory or if they are not in the chargeable territory if they are not chargeable then obviously we know that there is not going to be a transfer price if it is chargeable then the second question is can every chargeable service be accepted as a service charge or is there a secondary um, <clears throat> measure or proof that the taxpayer has to um, abide to. And that's where something called the benefit test comes in. The service can be chargeable, but it also needs to confer an economic benefit. So what are the key factors to consider when it comes to the benefit? Yeah, I think the benefit test is uh, very important, especially in service, right? You need to make sure that you know the benefit provided by the provider is of economic or commercial value, right? I think you, you heard of commercial value in terms of pricing, similar um, concept applies. Now, to be able to show that, right, there are two ways to look at this. One is to either to increase in return, right, in your recipient where services provided to the recipient, that service itself actually improved the recipient's business, you know, resulting in higher return, then that itself actually provide a benefit, right? The benefit is actually higher return, right? And on the other hand, and the other one is or reduction of costs, right? So if providing the service actually improved um, the recipient's business efficiency or you know, processes, which actually resulted in a reduced operating expenses, that that itself is actually a benefit provided and enjoyed by the recipient itself, right? So obviously then this is more of an economy value and you have to make sure that these are actually properly substantiated. And of course, lastly, which is an important part of TP, whether an independent in party in similar circumstances would be willing to pay for it, right? In, in transfer pricing, this is one of the things that you need to look at, whether an independent party in your circumstances will be willing to pay for it. Once you have actually performed that independent party test, then you'll be able to satisfy that uh, um, benefit test on your service side. Thank you, Hon Chuan. So now let's go through, I, I, I mean, in my view, not the easy part, but I mean, once you have your uh, operational part uh, kind of ironing out, then what is just the general views of tax authorities when it comes to markups, which is the last part of the service charge, if it's based on cost plus a markup, which is the most common way in which any service charge is this. Yeah. So I guess when I when we went through the cycle earlier on how to set up the transaction, obviously I need to add on that you know the cost <laughs> base actually go hand, hand in hand with your chargeable and non-chargeable activities, right? You have to look, look at your cost base into looking at those activities, whether they are non-chargeable, they fall into non-chargeable costs or chargeable costs, right? And after that, you have to go through your markup. Now this is one of the things that you know, RIB, um, the tax authorities will be looking at. What kind of markup are you looking at? What kind of markup should you impose on your service? If you look at this diagram, it's more like a pyramid, but if you look at this diagram, you know, we have low value services, marketing services, technical services. Obviously in services, we broadly correct characterize them into a low value adding services as well as value adding services. 
Now, low value end services are you know, support services such as your, your accounting, your IT, your human resources, whereby these services are considered support services, which generally speaking are of lower risks, hence would um, should be remunerated lower at lower return as opposed to a value adding services that would actually increase um, the business revenue or business impact to your operations. Hence, it will actually have a higher risks, meaning higher return, right? So if you look at marketing services and vending services, they, they would have a bigger portion of the markup, right? So generally speaking, value adding services will most like will have a higher markup than the low value adding services right so obviously this will need to be determined um, by way of a benchmarking study in malaysia unfortunately we have yet to receive a the so-called safe harbor rate whereby um if you look at the oecd transparency guidelines um, low value adding services you can use a 5% markup on it. But in Malaysia, we don't have such avenue. Hence, unfortunately, a benchmarking study will be required to come up with a arm's length rate um, for your arm's length markup. Thanks, Honchuan. And I think Malaysia is not alone. I think also these Asia don't have safe harbor. Um, the exception being Singapore, which is the only mm -hmm. one that has a routine service or low value service um, safe harbor, but it's exclusively and on, only for support service. It, and there is a list in the ETAX guide that talks about the type of services. But I think other than that, a majority of Southeast Asia does not have any guidance. So we, before we go into the um, case studies, maybe if you could summarize really quickly, what are the key challenges? Um, generally, and then maybe we can elaborate on this as we go along in the case studies. Yes, that, I think there are a lot of challenges on service transaction, even though it, it, it seems easy. Well, maybe that's why it's, it's easy, hence it's easily scrutinized by the tax authority. You know, we have gone through quite a few audits and also interviews with, you know, head of taxes. And one thing that comes to mind, which is very common, is services are actually the most challenged um, transactions. I would say globally, right? That's because it's easy to challenge and most authorities are actually equipped with the knowledge and to know what to expect and how to actually challenge your service transactions, where to look at, where are the pinpoint, where are the critical areas that they could just um, target and then scrutinize and then you know make an adjustment. So it's actually a very low hanging fruit for the tax authorities. You know, when they come in, they look at your service transaction first and go through your service transactions, then only go through the more complex um, cases. Now, the key challenges they are faced, you know, includes you know, evidence of benefit tests. We have gone through the benefit, benefit test earlier. This is one of the areas that creates tension because it's very hard to prove by taxpayers. Now, tax authorities are now asking evidence on a lot of things, phone calls, travel schedules of the personnel providing the services, you know, order requests. So now basically having an invoice showing that, okay, I've charged for um, intergroup services. It's not actually a support anymore. You need to provide more support in terms of benefit tests, right? What has been communicated to the receiver? kind of benefit were received by the recipient, have they actually received it, right? Apart from here, you know, whether we can actually quantify it, what are the benefits being received, right? Then next is the issue with the cost-based analysis. As mentioned earlier, a lot of taxpayers actually, they focus on you know, only the markup, only the markup. That once they have gone through the benchmarking study, my markup is actually within the arm's length total range, I can be done with it. I'm fairly certain that my intro group services are actually at arm's length. I have no worries on that. Now, when the RIB comes in, maybe they wouldn't look at your R markup because they may know that your markup is correct. 
then they look at your cost base. If you have not done anything to your cost base and you have actually included everything into your cost base, that would be a disaster because when they start excluding all the cost bases or some of the cost bases that were not included, then the over that bottom price will not be the same as what you have expected. Right. So that is very crucial. Next, we have okay, markup issues, appropriate implementation of markups, very common. Um, one of the things that are commonly misused is the use of 5% markup. Obviously, it's a safe harbor rate for routine services in various jurisdictions, but not in Malaysia. Right. So when, when you use that markup without any substantiation, you may risk um, being adjusted, right? So you need to make sure that you properly document down and then substantiate why you use the markup place. Next, we have discrepancies between general ledgers and invoices. Now, this really needs to be looked at and you need to make sure that it's consistent. When RB comes in, right, obviously you'll look at TB documentation, but at the same time, they will be, we'll also be looking at, they'll be cross-checking your charges. Are you actually um, document down it correctly in your general ledger versus your invoice? It's the same number. You know, there are a lot of circumstances where it doesn't even tie. I'm not sure why, even though the audit accounts has been audited, I would imagine it's tied. But there's a discrepancy. Now, when there are discrepancies, then it's very hard, unless you have proper justification, why are there discrepancies that happens in the first place? If the discrepancies are you know, not material, I think that's still fine. But if there are material discrepancies between these documents and these documents has already been handed to the IRB, then it's very hard to actually justify. And you have, you have a hard time justifying why the discrepancy happens in the first place. Then lastly, loss makers. As I explained earlier, you know, we have your, generally speaking, service providers, if, especially for low value added, they are generally remunerated at a fixed markup arrangement where because of a low risk, low return, that should have fixed markup, fixed margin. And if these service providers are in loss making position, RB will be asking you why they are low risk, generally speaking, regardless of um, the circumstances generally, they should have, they should still have the fixed markup and the losses should be borne by the entrepreneur of the group, right? So that's where it's be properly substantiated. Thank you, Hong right. I think with the following case studies and the core cases, people will understand how this theory works in <clears throat> real life. So maybe let's see a scenario number one, whereby we have a regional HQ located in um, <clears throat> Singapore, let's say, or any regional HQ, and that regionally uh, <clears throat> HQ provides some services. Let's call it, I know you don't like this word, management <laughs> service, but let's call it that is management service in the form of accounting, legal, and HR support. And they pay a cost plus a markup and the subsidiaries are in Malaysia and in Indonesia. So I guess issue number one is how to explain, or first of all, the question is, are those activities chargeable? Yeah. I mean, okay, I think I'll go through the like, issues. First issue is the naming of management services. Um, yeah. the first, first thing they ask is what is within your management services? If you are pro properly documented down as um, what Adrian has mentioned, if it's just like your know, HR accounts finance, and it's, it, it's in the same category as a non-value added, then that's, that can be properly substantiated. Um, in terms of explaining the, you know, business benefit to, you know, the subsidiaries and tax authorities, I think the first thing is to, when you have a TP exercise in place during the TP exercise, it's good to actually prepare and educate your um, subsidiaries as to why 
they require, why the business in um, for the subsidiary require those team in um, HQ for the success of the of their business, right? That's really important. And host also having a clear explanation in their agreements or contracts on the services provided um, by HQ, right? We have to look at why we have to ask ourselves why is it necessary for um, regional HQ to provide such services to us? Does it really help us? Does it help to the success of the business, right? Then why are there no similar roles in um, Malaysia or Indonesia? Why do we really do we really need um, the regional team? If without the regional team, we have to explain that the team then will not be successful in their venture in their respective countries if the regional team is not around to provide such support, right? So that we have to properly explain and document down, then even the team itself, the subjects will need to understand why we require such service from regional HQ, right? Then another common way to explain specific tasks they are provided is actually more so the other way around. So instead of saying regional HQ providing um, benefit, then we can also show that the subsidiaries, you know, the Malaysia, uh, Malaysia and Indonesia actually are requesting, they are re actually requested for this service from the subsidiary level so that, you know, it will improve the business operations in, um, in the subsidiary level and that we need to link this to the business success um, to the subsidiary level for Malaysia and Indonesia. Right, that's two ways to look at it. That's actually a really, really good way to, to explain it. Is there a necessity of the recipient to request for that service? Hmm. Um, let's talk about the, in this scenario, another factor is, okay, it's chargeable, it has benefits. So then how do we go about uh, pushing down the cost from regional HQ to the subsidiaries. And that's where uh, point number three here is relevant, which is the indirect method. So maybe we can just go in the following slide of what this indirect method means mm -hmm. and how is it used to pull down the cost? So basically, if you look at the indirect method, so it really happens when you have obviously more than one um, recipient um conjunct um together receive benefits from one service right one of the ways to actually allocate this is through the indirect method right so the regional hq have all the costs incurred for the services provided right so we're looking at first obviously we look at the cost pool when we look at the cost pool we need to make sure that within the cost pool are all chargeable service chargeable costs incurred Right, so once you have identified the chargeable costs and put all these services costs into the cost pool, then next, obviously, you have to identify the service recipient. Now, once you have identified your service recipient, which in this case, Malaysia and Indonesia, then you have to look at what type of um, services was provided. Now, that, that's where it comes interesting, right? When I say, you know, you have management services, there's no allocation for management services per se. You have to look at the nature of services that were being provided. And then from there, you have to then, based on your most appropriate method, you think that what's the best allocation, most appropriate allocation key to allocate the costs accordingly, right? So in this scenario, if you, the examples given, you know, administrative services revenue, very hard to say. So one thing is we have to make keep in mind is revenue is actually not um, preferred by RRB in terms of allocation unless you need to properly substantiate. Not, not saying that you can't use revenue, you can, but you need to make sure that you substantiate to show that you know the best allocation is actually based on revenue, right? Then the next one is your know, HR services. There's a headcount, IT services, maybe number of PC or you know, number of user IDs, right? These are the you know, common allocation keys to properly allocate your cost into the respective recipients, 
right? So that, that's how you allocate through the indirect methods. Thank you, Honchuan. So let's see the second example. So this is the example of a regional HQ who has the different service recipients, and then HQ needs to pull the cost, needs to find a way to split the cost between the subsidiaries, obviously assuming that we already say that the activity is chargeable and there is a benefit. So let's see a common scenario, which is this case, which is the scenario of the a service provider or the, um, how do you call it? It could be a shared service. So we have a company which with the entrepreneur and it has what is called a, a low risk or maybe value added service uh, entity in Malaysia. And for that, the entrepreneur has a contract with company C whereby it pays a service fee that is based on total cost of company C plus a market. So can we just go through some of the issues here, which is, first of all, um, the, from, from Malaysia perspective? Yeah. So I think as you explained the, you know, the scenario earlier, you know, the first is basic of characterization. Now, we need to make sure that what Adriana has mentioned earlier is correct, right? Whether it's when you have an entrepreneur, whether they are properly characterized as entrepreneur, right? Then company C, whether it's properly characterized as a routine service provider or a, um, a low limited risks. So it, it really depends on, um, you have to properly substantiate based on obviously you have to perform a function analysis to make sure that these companies are properly characterized, which you know, linked to number two, where when, when you have um, proper characterization, then do you actually have proper contracts um, to actually you know, delineate you know, the, the allocation of risk between the two, right? When you have proper function analysis, then you have the proper risks um, that is be, being assumed by the respective parties within. And then judging by this scenario, right, we have to look at the, the service is actually not cost plus uh, markup and complete C is the one that is actually a fixed markup um, entity. Right to ensure these are, then you need to make sure that your function analysis are performed, your contracts are properly delineated, all this with this arrangement. Then, lastly, of course, when you look at the markup, is is actually the markup correct? Um, what what's the function performed by Malaysia? What services are actually provided um, by Malaysia? And then from there, whether obviously then we have to go back to the cost first. Cost base are correct. Then is the um, markup correct in respect to the service provided by Malaysia in relation to its characterization as well the risks um, being assumed by Malaysia as a whole, right? These are very important elements that you need to make sure that to document down and properly uh, administered. Thank you, Anshan. I think that's a really good point. For all we know, maybe this 5% is a missed characterization of a markup. Yeah. Uh, we put it as 5% just for simplicity, but it doesn't mean mm -hmm. in any way, shape, or form that when you have this structure of 5% is the correct uh, markup. It could be different depending on the activities that company C performs. Now, let's see a uh, third scenario before we talked about the... Um, uh, two core cases. Um, the third scenario is um, different spin because it's the situation where we have an ultimate parent company located maybe in Europe or maybe in the US and a regional company located in Singapore. And the regional has two subsidiaries in Malaysia and in Indonesia, but it happens to be that these subsidiaries are paying again the so-called management fee or management services to both company A and company B. So I guess the question here of chargeability and type of activities that are chargeable are quite is quite important. So what are your thoughts on this? Yeah. So I guess naming the management fee may be more accurate in this um, scenario. On the basis, oh, okay, it really depends on what services are being provided by company A and company B to its 
to C and D, right? If you look at, obviously, if company A would be the holding company, parent entity, I'll imagine that strategic management services will, will be provided, but this, in this scenario, I'm not sure. So then management services B will be arise. So the first thing you need to do is look at what services are being provided by company A and company B, whether there are actual service being provided, meaning employees stationed in A and B um, providing, and employees um, providing services to C and D. And another challenge is um, obviously what kind the services provided by A and B if there are of management services, then what are they of duplicative services? Are, are they in relation to a non-chargeable service? Um, so we will need to go through whether assess whether they are chargeable uh, in terms of company A and company B. If then when they're on a recipient point of view, then you need to look at obviously in company A and company B point of view, it may be chargeable, but then if you are receiving the same service then you need to look at why are they charging you the same service being provided, right? So that, that's one of the challenge that you may face when you look at two different levels of um, holding company or parent company providing services downwards. Because now one is the ultimate holding company and company B may be a regional where you know, different services uh, may, may be provided. So you need to assess whether they are duplicated now, then the next thing and also important, which is to look at your benefit tests, whether company C and D benefited from both services or not. So now you have to go through the benefit test, as we had mentioned earlier, charge a benefit test, then go through whether um, you are being charged um, correctly uh, based on the management services fee. So cost base, whether they are chargeable, then go down again to the markup where they are charging properly on a the markup, then only then you'll be able to decide whether this uh, will not have any potential challenges. Thank you, Hunchman. I think the point is that it doesn't mean that you cannot have that two layers. It's just that it has to be very well explained that is not duplicative because I will say, that my bet on something like this is that IRB or any other tax authority will definitely question that. That will be the first question that they have in their minds. Mm -hmm. Okay, so lastly, before we open for questions, why don't we go through these two um, a case law studies and maybe you can start with um, Malaysia versus Shell? Yeah, which is good. I, I guess it's good to have real cases um, on hand because this fairly recent in back in 2019. So this case with um, Shell, so a bit of background is the principal activity of the Shell Malaysia was to provide shared services to related parties within the Shell group. And at that point in time, there was a CCA cost contribution arrangement in place for the sharing of services and resources within the Shell group. And the shared services provided by Malaysia is part of that arrangement. Now, nevertheless, uh, RRB conducted a PV audit and we characterized the CCA as, a, as an intra group service arrangement. So that itself resulting in an additional tax payable of 15.6 million ringgit in 2019 alone, right? They actually went backwards as well for other years. Now, Let's look at why this has ballooned into a really high, huge tax payable, right? And obviously I have not explained um, cost contribution arrangement earlier, but I'll just give you a brief background. background. So a CCA is actually a contractual arrangement amongst um, participants within the, group of, um, within the group to share common costs and risks. Um, this is generally to more so to develop, um, produce, or obtain assets, um, you know, your IPs or rights. An example is that you have your joint um, research project to produce a product, uh, product, you know, product development. Now you jointly um, 
share the cost and contribute the cost to receive the benefits from the development. Then the key point is that the costs are shared, right? And there are no markup in place, right? So that's, that's the most important point in place. So they have used the CCA as a rule for the shared service. Shared service is actually part, just part of it. There are other um, contributions in place. Then now with this in place, while a interactive service is actually service I mentioned, provided with a cost and an arm stack markup in place. So, so the markup is very important, right? So in this scenario, when you have a CCA and we characterize it into intergroup services and you impose a markup and being adjusted and penalty on top, then you actually, that's the risks that you have to face. So when you actually have a CCA in place or going to think about a CCA, make sure that you look at all the angles, especially in terms of services, and making sure that those are more of a shared, um, shared cost instead of a service arrangement, and then properly document it down into the contract and make sure that it's sort of foolproof. Thank you, Hanchuan. So I guess the point is that you can have CCAs that help you to potentially not have to do markups, but it has to be done properly in the sense that it cannot be something that just one party is providing a service. It has to be a number of parties doing something for each other. Um, if it's just funding, it is really just a service. And the last uh, case, it comes to the question that a lot of, uh, there are a few questions in, in the Q&A about what to do to present evidence on the benefit test. So this is between a Singapore call, uh, a Singapore entity called Archipelago so Resources located in Singapore and its subsidiary in Indonesia. And the Archipelago uh, Resources Singapore was providing um, management services in the nature of HR, IT, accounting, legal, and project finance. The service fee was 3.35 million, and it was a total cost plus a 7% markup. So the argument came from Indonesian point of view, the Indonesian tax authority saying that, or challenging, not really the total value of the services or the marker, their uh, argument was basically that there wasn't a service being provided because uh, the Indonesian entity didn't provide enough evidence to show the economic benefit and that the service existed. And this is a key word, existed in the, in the first place. So basically, uh, what taxpayer had to do through the through the um, uh, <clears throat> through the hearings uh, with the court was to be very very thorough in providing a series of documents to uh, prove that the service in fact existed and therefore it was chargeable and therefore there was a benefit. So. Um, Key things that they have to identify was first, obviously, a service agreement, who was the service provider, daily work reports from the service provider, for example, if there is time reports or project reports that allow you to have very clear recording on the activities performed from Indonesia, evidence of travel. So obviously this was for the year 2013, so it was pre-COVID, evidence of outputs and emails, evidence on deliverables and obviously the contemporaneous documentation at the time that the service agreement entered in place, not when um, by the time the tax return was due, when the service agreement was entered. And because of that, the taxpayer was actually successful in defending the service charge and the claim from the Indonesian tax authority was disallowed actually. So the tax, in other words, the taxpayer uh, won. So I think that's where we always say that it's so critical to have a proof 
that the service existed. And you have to have it at the time that the service happened because for those of you who are not familiar with audits, audits come several years after the service actually happened. And if you don't have proper record keeping and proper um, governance, you're gonna scramble to be able to prove that the service existed and there, there was an economic benefit as well. So the value of the service charge is important, but it's very interesting to see how the Indonesian tax authority did not tackle the value of the service in the first place. They were very clear that they didn't believe that the service exists. And by that, what the tax authority is really saying is that it's not going to allow any portion of the service charge. So the impact from a tax adjustment point of view is higher when the tax authority says that they do not believe that this service exists, because what they're really saying is that they are not going to allow not even one portion of the service fee. Whereas if the arguments are around the service charge and the markups is a much easier argument because at least you can have hope that a portion of the service charge will be accepted. Maybe not all of it, but part of it. So the impact is obviously uh, higher. Um, when it comes to proving the, the whether a service exists or not. So what are your uh, conclusion uh, points, Hong Chan? Um, I guess as we have emphasized, contracts are crucial um in tp not just services transactions now that you know audit are increasing and that contracts is already more more or less a mandatory thing it's crucial for you to formalize your contracts for all your inter intercompany transactions and making sure that it's properly documented down with your your nature of service space your markup and the respective allocation keys and then obviously your invoices GL will really need to be um, also have correct description and also be consistent within the documents. Yeah, the first one, agreements are crucial, obviously. I think we have gone to, to the majority of these points, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, the agreements, making sure that the benefit and the uh, evidence of the existing is there, obviously paying attention to the markup and the operational aspect is important, uh, but uh, it's equally important to look at, you know, benefit, chargeables, etc. And we talked about also the fact that we need to be aware about service entities and making sure that they are in substance a service provider and basically um, very important to use the function analysis for this purpose so with that maybe let's just open to um, the questions um, as we do have a few as we get towards the end so let me start with the first one why is on-call services not chargeable? HQ legal team providing ad hoc legal oh, yes, as and when required by subsidiary. Is this considered an on-call services? Please provide examples of on-call service. Yeah. I think that um, I provided the examples earlier, which is the, you know, the, the IT um, uptime, server uptime services where you need to make sure that that is part of a contract and that it's like, you know, 99.9%. .9%. But when you're talking about ad hoc legal support, you know, does that mean that you wouldn't be able to get that legal support from elsewhere or not, right? Does it need to be charged? How, what is the charges? Why do you call it on call? Why do you think that it's the HQ, HQ legal team is on call when are the legal team actually 24-7? Are they, are they not? Are they actually on standby every time to provide such legal team, or do they have the working hours that you know only those working hours are comply to the? I think the other of the other issue is whether you have a proper contract with your HQ on these legal services, because if ad hoc legal support means that you don't have a proper contract and that you just call them at whenever you need them, 
then that could be a dangerous territory where you could be in the on-call territory, which is why I think even if you're requesting ad hoc legal support, the key to contract the on-call situation is to have a contract. This is a sec second question, which is what is the practical way to support the benefit? Extensive documentation is very impractical in your experience, what has been acceptable? So I think we have spoken just here with the core case, but I think at a minimum, a uh, contract, uh, some, if you do time reports on time sheets, some evidence on uh, the people who work in whatever they're charging you for uh, and how that output was there. I think some record meetings of how often do you speak with each other as well, uh, if you're not traveling anymore. Uh, and I think one of the things that we have seen lately is also having the order from the um, uh, from from the uh, provider uh, point of view. Um, let me just look at the. Maybe Honshun is having a technical problem. Let me just look at the other one. Say if company A, a in Malaysia receives management fees from its holding company as 100% of revenue. Uh, hi, Honshun. I was just going to the other uh, yeah. question. Say if company A in Malaysia receives management free from its holding company as 100% revenue for a few years, revenue fall below 500K, so company A not subject to SST. However, this year management income above 500, which the companies also should be subject to sales tax. But the company do not want to be subject and propose to rename management service in the TPDO. Mm. I wouldn't be able to answer on the sales uh, tax issue. I think whether you call it in your TPDO management fee or management services, I think they are generally interchangeable. It's more about what they mean. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think uh, uh, renaming any services, you can call it anything, but in substance, if it's a service, I'm not sure about the SST part, if it's service, you have to look at the nature, regardless of what the name you provide. Yeah. It, it, I think anything in tax it. these days is about the nature. Where you're talking yeah. about indirect tax or where you're talking direct tax is all about the nature, the substance. Um, okay. So in your experience, does Indonesia Tax Authority often challenge the TP study conducted, resulting in additional tax rates in Indonesia? An additional cost adjustment not being accepted by IRB IRS. How can the taxpayer prepare for such as incidents? That unfortunately is the issue with TP. Mm, for example, if the double taxation issue is substantial, uh, obviously, I guess one of the things is that if you are convinced that your position is correct, and it should be accepted by uh, the Indonesian tax authority. You always have the avenue to go to court and take the Indonesian tax authority to court if your the value of your dispute is substantial enough. If there is no remedy and you suffer double tax, there is the option of mutual agreement procedures in Singapore to uh, ask IRS on your behalf to resolve a double taxation issue when a foreign tax authority does an adjustment. But obviously that is uh, an avenue that makes sense from if the damage is quite material, of course. I don't know if you have something similar in Malaysia for like mutual agreement procedures. Yeah, same. I think it, it's the same pro process. Okay. Singapore parent company charges Malaysia subsidiary management fee. Singapore prepared TPDOC based on cost plus 5% markup. However, or not TPDOC prepared for Malaysian subsidiary. Malaysian subsidiary suffers huge loss due to the management fee explained. Expense claim tax deduction. In this case, how can I support managers' fees at our name? I think this is a typical situation where if your management fee is always putting the taxpayer in Malaysia in a lost position, 
I think there is a clear risk of IRB denying the deduction on that management fee. Yeah, agreed. I wouldn't know what the circumstances are, but it could be that, uh, and also it depends on what type of entity is Malaysia, because if the Malaysian entity is just starting operations and hasn't picked up, mm. then maybe it's reasonable to be in losses. Uh, or if really, really the management fee is, ex is, is excessive. Yeah, I think the most important part is you get your TP documentation prepared for the Malaysia one, because it's not just Malaysia about looking at the, the arm's length of management fee, it's looking about the penalty that you incurred if you don't have TP documentation in place first. Right, the penalty is like 20,000 to 100,000, right? That's more, more than what you can charge for. Right. First, you need to get that done. I think it's best to get both done because even if you have your Singapore prepared TP doc, it, that itself does not defend the Malaysian position, right? Even though it, it says it's as arm length, that's maybe in Singapore's point of view, but not Malaysia's point of view. Yeah, that's a really good point because the Singapore TP doc requirements can be is, is, uh, somewhat different to the Malaysian and it doesn't incorporate the Malaysian point of view. We do the accounting for a subsidiary that holds IP but has no employees. Can we still charge intra-group services to the subsidiary? You can if you're if there is a service being provided. Um, there is other things that jump here, which is a company holding an IP with no employees. That is not necessarily a service a service fee risk issue is a general TP issue um, because holders of IP with no employees doesn't necessarily can claim the benefit or the economic benefit of the IP. So if I answer only on the service charge alone, I would say yes, you can't uh, if there is a benefit being provided to the subsidiary. But there is other aspects here that just ring mm -hmm. a little bit of um, alarm bells. Yeah. Um, in our group, our AU company, AU Amashimi in uh, Australia, is the APAC IT hub, which provides services to a few APAC entities, including Malaysian company. Malaysian company has also team supporting Australia company in providing such as IT services in APAC. From a contracting perspective, are there any risk if we have only one contract to cover? Malaysian receiving, providing IT services from a U company? I, I don't have the question in place. So I, can't, I actually can't look at the whole thing in place. <laughs> I don't know so, why I can see it. So the issue is that the APAC entity in Australia provides services to various entities including Malaysia and then Malaysia also support. I think you, you it depends on how you write that contract. I have hesitation on this because I suspect that the service that APAC IT provides to a Malaysian entity is different to the services that the Malaysian entity provides. And then there is other operational aspects, which is that if Australia provides IT services to several subsidiaries. So that might be one contract between Australia and different entities. And then you may have a separate contract between Malaysia and Australia. Uh, I feel that keep it separately is a bit uh, easier because um, I suspect that the specifics of the type of support and the IT can be different. In this type of arrangement, you, usually the Australia will be doing the more high value IT and Malaysia will be doing more the support IT, which is significantly different. And if the parties on top of that is not the same, I tend to think that maybe two agreements is a better avenue. Yeah, 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 definitely. Okay, so I think with that, we are done. For today, thank you everyone for attending to our webinar today. Um, we is our free sharing. We don't ask for compensation, but we ask for likes and subscriptions. So if you can like us and subscribe in YouTube, in YouTube 
and in all our social media channels, that would be great because that will encourage us to create more content for you. So the likes is our compensation and we will treasure them forever. So coming soon, we will have other webinars coming 20 of October. We have managing transfer pricing in Singapore, Indonesia and Malaysia. We have 27 of October, end of year TP tips for Malaysian taxpayers. We have another that is not here, which is 6 of October with um, Malaysian Institute of Accountants, also known as MIA. Um, they are not missing in action. They are just happen to be MIA and very active actually. So um, we would love to have you in our webinars with um, MIA as well, coming in 6th of October and also another one in November. And with that, that's all from us for today. Uh, if you want to reach out to us, this is our email and number in Malaysia. And I'm sure in our socials, you can find also our other offices. Thank you, everyone, and have a pleasant afternoon. Thank you.